It's now my pleasure to, uh, to ask Tuong Fan uh, to come up and talk about uh, anaesthetic management and imaging in pulmonary vein isolation and RF ablation. Certainly in terms of the spectrum of EP work, um, atrial uh, uh, fibrillation ablation is uh, the more challenging, the more involved and, 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 and often the most rewarding of the anaesthetic uh, endeavours. And uh, you know, any time that you're passing catheters from the right side of the heart through the septum to the left side, it uh, it offers a procedural risk and a risk that um, uh, people working in the lab need to be mindful of. So my perspective is one of uh, of a, a very crowded non-theatre setting, often with the uh, dominant C arm uh, navigation equipment, um, ablation equipment, and I'll go through what I've gleaned from three years of doing. Uh, this sort of work, um, predominantly at Cabrini, um, <clears throat> where we use general anaesthesia and interoperative uh, echo uh, as a standard. So most patients uh, uh, presenting for paroxysmal AF have good looking hearts, uh, but it is important to have a look at the pericardium because that's, that will be a focus post-procedure uh, and also um, to identify things like uh, epidural fat pad on the right, um, over the right ventricle, so you not miss uh, misguided into thinking that um, that is a source of, um, of, of tamponade post-procedure. But we do have a spectrum um, uh, more involved work in, in patients with low EF or uh, valvular disease uh, does come through the lab now as well. Um, one of the first points to call is to exclude uh, clot in the uh, um, atrial thrombus. They would have ha generally had a CT scan, but it's important to to exclude that because there are instances of resistance or failure of anticoagulation therapy. And here um, we've been through the talk previously, this is a good looking left atrial appendage. Um, you can see the pectinate muscles and the velocities um, are reassuring. Uh, this is an example on a patient who actually uh, is on warfarin um, but has um, smoke coming out of the uh, left atrial appendage and increase uh, echogenicity at the apex um, of the atrial appendage. So this resistance uh, to anticoagulation can happen with warfarin. It can also happen with the novel anticoagulants. This one's a case report that's in press uh, on rivaroxaban after uh, eight weeks of, of continuous therapy. Um, so on the left, you see the filled out thrombus um, and then uh, uh, this was identified at the time of um, a prior to AF ablation. The procedure was cancelled. The patient was placed on warfarin for six months and you see recanalation of, of the uh, atrial appendage. Uh, this is the, uh, the main view uh, in terms of guiding the septal puncture. It's a uh, slightly upper metasophageal at, at around 60 to, to 90 degrees. What you do want to see is the aortic valve um, in view, uh, the intraatrial uh, septum, uh, the thin bit and the thick bit, um, and also this is the posterior part. You know, it's important, this is important because you can see the catheter uh, engaging with the septum. You can see the structures you want to avoid, the aortic valve, the aorta, and posteriorly, um, you know, the posterior part of the left atrial, uh, left atrium is, is where you don't want to go. So the procedures will generally have uh, both fluoroscopic and echo guidance, and it gives them uh, two planes to work with to uh, have confidence of a catheter um, engagement with the septum. The fluoroscopic plane will give them an up and down or keflad cordad plane, and the echo adds that anterior posterior orth orthogonal plane. And this slightly slow moving uh, picture is the septal puncture um, live so you can see engagement of the catheter in um, tip uh, into the thin part of the um, fossa ovalis. Uh, it's important to uh, track the catheter uh, right to the, 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 the pointy tip where it engages uh, because that's where the puncture is going to be made. Sometimes you can cut the catheter um, not at the tip um, so make sure there's the tenting uh, which, which gives you um, uh, the, the, the exact position. And um, uh, this procedure uses a two uh, septal puncture technique and the, se the second one's going through now. 
and you'll see bubbles um, traversing into the left atrium um, as they cross that. And the, the, this is a fairly um, straightforward, reassuring image, but it's not always like that. I think the, the, when I think back about the, the, the times that, um, that I or my colleagues have run into trouble, it's often cases where you don't get a good view and it's probably an indication of the planes not being uh, entirely normal and, and your assumptions of where they lie aren't quite correct. So you need to be a little bit um, more careful with both fluoroscopy and echo if you don't get uh, an adequate view. Um, problem areas would be engagement in the, th in the thick part of the interatrial septum um, uh, or uh, tenting and direction to anteriorly, putting at risk the aortic valve and the aorta, or tenting to posteriorly. Other circumstances can be if you have an um, intraatrial aneurysm and there can be quite a lot of tenting, um, or if the intraatrial septum is uh, thickened and, um, and resistant to puncture, uh, it's very reassuring to know where exactly that tip actually is. Uh, predominantly I use 2D, but of course 3D is available, uh, but it's, it's really just um, a toy here. You just, uh, I don't really have a lot of time procedurally to, to capture these images, but I did this. It just shows the two catheters uh, in the LA. This is a view from the LA. Um, the catheters are going, passing through a thin bit of the fossovalis away from the aortic valve and away from the posterior aspect of left atrium. Um, now, I mentioned that we do it under general anaesthesia and certainly amongst the cohort of, of, of um, uh, cardiac anaesthesis and EP anaesthesis that I talked to, uh, GA is what's asked and GA is what we provide, but there is a variation in how it's done. Some um, um, studies uh, show that there's, there's some people doing it under sedation, but the reason why GA is preferred is it offers better control and actually offers in this study um, better results. Uh, at 18 months, the general anaesthesia group had 88% 80, free of arrhythmias um, compared to 69% in sedation. And this is related to better surgical conditions. And at redo, it was found that um, <clears throat> the, the cases that had sedation had high rates of, uh, of, of pulmonary vein reconnection, indicating incomplete isolation at the time. Procedurally, the GAs were actually quicker as well. Uh, going on um, to you know uh, suitability of, of, of procedural conditions, um, one thing when I first stepped into uh, this sort of work is the request for apnea, um, uh, which is not great from my point of view because it means uh, constant uh, vigilance in terms of a period of apnea and 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 and. Uh, deoxygenation, uh, and then followed by you know large sort of recruitment manoeuvres. Um, so it's apnea, recruitment, apnea, recruitment. It becomes quite tedious during a two, three hour case. Um, but the reason why apnea is asked for is because the catheter stability is better. It engages better with the myocardium. And here in a uh, in a study, uh, the force um, at the tip of the catheter is more consistent and higher. Um, during apnea than it is with tidal ventilation. Um, I did hear my uh, EP guys talk about high frequency jet ventilation. I wasn't too happy about that because high frequency jet ventilation is delivering a very small pulses um, of, of jet ventilation to minimize diaphragm movement. The problem with that is while it gives good procedural conditions, it's very tricky from an anaesthetic point of view. It's not suitable for some patients. It carries procedural risks related to aspiration, dislodgement of catheter, pneumothorax and barotrauma. So um, what I gave them was uh, somewhere in between. A low tidal volume, high frequency ventilation um, uh, strategy where I did try to minimise the diaphragm movement as much as I could. Um, um, it does require some adjustment of the ventilation strategies, uh, making sure there's adequate expiration time to avoid stacking and gas trapping. It, uh, you do have to allow for um, hypercapnia and apnea is ensured by remifentanyl infusion. And with this strategy, uh, you can get uninterrupted ablation time, conditions just as good as, um, as apnea, and I think it makes both, both parties pretty happy. When we're talking about removing uh, the burden of disease related to AF, we're talking about um, freedom from arrhythmias and freedom from antiarrhythmic side effects. 
Um, but that has to be weighed uh, against some of the more serious um, uh, complications related to uh, AF ablation. And um, it's a fairly consistent that the complication rate will range between 4 to, to 9 to 10%. And in this uh, uh, survey of 16,000 AF ablations in 2010, um, the overall complication rate was 4.5. Um, with the most uh, common is tamponade, which uh, I'll go to next, um, as well as stroke. Um, they're, they're, they're probably the, the two that, that I feel procedurally that um, intraoperatively we, we can um, uh, have strategies to help reduce. And it's also clear that the complication rate is dependent on not only procedural, uh, a procedural learning curve, but probably also periprocedural learning curve. Um, in high volume centres, there are much lower complications than low volume centres. Uh, tamponade is something that if you're embarking on this, you've got to have a strategy of managing hypotension and um, uh, persistent hypertension with echocardiographic or fluoroscopic evidence of cat tamponade. Uh, it generally involves uh, the utilisation of pigtail drain, um, uh, preferably with guidance. And in this series of 40, uh, they all manage this way. None of them requires stenotomy and a few needed a red cell transfusion. Um, okay, so just to summarise, the recipe for AF ablation, um, uh, the anaesthesia recipe is uh, general anaesthesia, uh, arterial line monitoring, intraoperative uh, echocardiography, a balanced anaesthetic, a volatile maintenance, a remifentanyl infusion, and I advocate a, a low tidal volume, high frequency ventilation or apnea. Uh, anticoagulation strategy is important. Uh, heparinization uh, at the time of ablation. High risk patients can remain on warfarin, uh, and now we're seeing patients being done on dubiquitran with the advent of, of a reversal agent. I'm sparing with my use of intravenous fluids because um, with the irrigation, already one or two litres is given. Uh, familiarity with the denosine, which is uh, used to mask dormant AF, isoprenaline, as well as uh, defibrillator pads go with the procedure. All the patients get a warming blanket. We don't use um, uh, urinary catheter as a routine. Some centres use a soft shield temperature monitoring, but I understand there's a problem with the specificity of that. Um, occasionally, the coronary sinus can't be catheterised and a jugular vein approach has to be used. So hopefully that's something for um, people who work in the EP lab to understand the anaesthesia perspective. Thanks.